get by It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See like like a beach If you find the same like right now I feel like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. I'm going to introduce in a second Katie Wagner of KWSM Digital. And Katie, I always like to mention past episodes of the podcast people should check out. And there's some dating back. Um, I was talking to someone earlier today. I had Pat Williams, who essentially kind of started the Orlando Magic, um, and he pre-sold the tickets before they brought the franchise to Orlando. So he went door to door and and pre-sold season tickets. And when he sold them out, he's like, okay, we could bring the Orlando Magic to Orlando. He was also responsible for drafting Charles Barkley and Shaquille O'Neal. And he also has 18 children. Um, wow. Not all, you know, I think 11 of them or, or a number of them are adopted, but uh, amazing story. And others like that, Check out inspiredinsider.com for, for more episodes. And this episode is brought to you by Rise 25. And at Rise 25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships and partnerships. And we do that by helping you run your podcast. Um, and, you know, Katie, for me, the number one thing in my life is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and the companies I admire and share with the world what they're doing and have them on my podcast like yourself. Uh, so if you've thought about starting a podcast, you should. Um, if you have questions, we're here for you. Go to rise25.com, contact us. We're happy to answer any questions that you have. And I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Katie Wagner. She spent more than 15 years as a journalist and she spent a decade as a television and radio news anchor. She worked at CBS, ABC, Fox, CNN, National Public Radio. So she's no stranger to these calls and uh, interviews. And so uh, right now, you know, in 2010, she realized that she could use those skills. She learned in the newsroom to help business owners connect with their clients online. She opened KWSM. You know, she was telling me before, she's like, I thought I was just going to help companies be a consultant in my bedroom. That turned into 40 staff. She has offices all over the country. And um, you can everyone can check out her website, what she's working at, kwsmdigital.com. Katie, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. I love what you're doing here. Thank you. And I want to start off with, you know, a big part you said, you know, you just learned along the way. Um, and we all kind of stand on shoulders of giants. Um, and I'd love to hear. You're a part of a number of groups that, um, you know, we're a part of Provisors together. That's how we met. And some of the lessons learned from some of the groups that you're in, because I feel like that collective knowledge from peers is just always helpful. Yeah. You know, before I started my company, I was a television anchor for my whole career. And, and I like to say I'd never even had a corporate job. I, I didn't never been the boss of anybody. You know, I, I was in a different field. And when I became the CEO of my company and we started growing, I had employees, I had to figure that out um, really fast and all alone. You know, one of the downsides to being a CEO, Jeremy, is that there is no one above you to tell you how to do things better or if you're doing a good job or not. And so I quickly became involved with an organization called Vistage, which is a CEO peer group. And I think that is probably the most important thing I've done in my leadership journey was find a group of uh, mostly men, but other business leaders who had been where I was, who had grown successful companies and continued to face, you know, the challenges and the obstacles that I was up against along the way. And so some of the things they've taught me were, were, you know, to go with my gut and believe that I can do this, that I know how to lead the company, that I can make good decisions um, and make them and don't look back. Um, you know, they've taught me a lot about communicating uh, with my staff, with my clients. Uh, they've taught me a lot about what's important when running a business. You know, big ideas are only good if you keep the balance sheet in mind. And, um, and they've really pushed me to be better than I could have been alone and, and also built a better business than I could have alone. Uh, so I'm, I'm grateful for those relationships. And then, you know, of course, our, our Provisors colleagues, I love that that's how you and I met. I'm, I'm a big fan of Provisors, which is a, a professional networking 
Association. And I think the biggest thing I've learned from my ProVisors colleagues is really the value of giving back and being there for each other. And, you know, if one of their clients needs help, they can just call me and I'll give them the answer or have a quick phone call with that client. And they'll do the same for me. And it's really a supportive network where we share a lot of knowledge and expertise. And that makes us all better. It makes us all better resources for our clients. And it, it makes us better at our jobs just to know we have those people who have our back if we need it. Hey, talk, take me back to the journey. So you're thinking, I'm just going to be in my bedroom, be a consultant, help some companies to now growing to 40 or more staff, offices all over. What was the, uh, take me through the evolution of the services you offered, you know, starting with kind of the consulting. Yeah. So I'm going to actually take you back a little bit further than that. So I was a television anchor for 15 years and thought that's what I do with my entire life. And, you know, around 2004, 2005, when social media started to get big, the powers that be at my station said, oh my gosh, you know, no one's going home to watch the five o'clock news anymore. They can get headlines on Facebook and Twitter. They can see videos on YouTube. And they pointed at me and said, go out there and learn to use these channels and get our audience back. And so I did learn to use them. And, and as I got more immersed in digital and saw the power of using digital channels to communicate with your audience, I realized that I, I didn't think our audience was coming back, at least not in the same way. And I thought that this was going to change the way we communicated and that business owners would need to know how to use digital channels to reach their audiences over time. So I retired from my TV job. And, and what you said is right. I thought I would be, you know, in my yoga pants, in my spare bedroom with my laptop, and I would do some consulting and help people. And I quickly had a client base. I, I, it was, I like to say it was kind of the right thing at the right time. Did you, you were early on. on. I mean, you were right in the inflection point. Yeah, I started the company in Orange County, California, uh, t- almost 12 years ago. And we were the first digital only agency in Orange County. So there were a lot of traditional marketing agencies that started to offer digital or try to, but we were the first to say, no, we're only going to do digital. We're not doing any traditional marketing. And people told me I was crazy, right? They said, this digital thing's going away. You're, you're a fool to hang your hat on that. And it ended up being the right thing at the right time. I did do some, com- some consulting, but quickly companies would say, well, can you do it for us? You know, can you just take this part off our plate? And so I hired a staff within about six weeks. I had three employees and uh, a full roster of clients. And I joked that my husband was my fourth employee because he was in operations management for Starbucks corporate. And as we started to grow a company, I said, oh, gosh, you know, you're either going to have to come and help me run this thing or I'm going to hire somebody who will. And he did. He left his job. He became my fourth employee. He's still with the company today. And he started to run the contracts, invoicing, you know, business side of things, operations. And I really evolved the service offerings part of things. So you asked about sort of that evolution. When we first started the agency, I usually don't talk about this, but I'm going to tell you. It was called, brace yourself, this is not brilliant, Katie Wagner Social Media. Because again, I thought it was going to be a consultant. And I thought that all we would do was social media because that's how we started. And that is all we did. And then as we started to realize that social media in a vacuum wasn't as as effective as having a good website we could drive to or using video in that content and some of these other digital tools came into play, we started adding them to our repertoire and we got in-house web designers, SEO people, we had in-house videographers, photographers, content creators, graphic designers, and we started really building out a sort of integrated holistic staff that could do all of digital. And uh, then I got wise in 2018, so eight years into the business, and determined it was not all about me, nor was it all about social media. And we rebranded as KWSM, a digital marketing agency. And since that time, we've really been uh, full service. We were really full service before then. But these days, we really focus on the intersection of all those tools or tactics and how they work together to serve our clients. And most of our clients hire us to do lead generation generate leads or online sales. And we design integrated strategies that take all of those tactics and combine them in a way that's right for that business to create that lead gen infrastructure. So uh, we've come a long way. (laughs) You know, uh, I was looking in your site um, and you serve clients like Dale Carnegie, which actually I like every couple of years to listen to how to win friends, influence people. One of my favorites, Um, Mitsubishi, 
F45. Um, so I'll, I want to hear about some of the stuff, you know, they come to you and what you do. Um, and I mean, I know you help online courses, software and, you know, in construction, even the poop plunger. The poop right? plunger, yes. What, yes what, so what'd you do with the poop plunger? Body body. So this, this is a good story, actually. So the poop plunger was invented by um, a guy in Oregon. His name's Carl Hickerson. And he just had this idea to make a plunger that looked like the poo emoji. And he kind of thought it was funny and it was a joke <laughs> with his friends. And he set up a Kickstarter and Carl hired KWSM to help run the Kickstarter. And so, you know, we created content. We set up this fundraising crowdfunding campaign and he got the money to fund the poop plunger. But in this, we got so much awareness and so much affinity for the brand going that they were actually acquired by Squatty Potty. And wow. now poop plunger is part of Squatty Potty. Carl is off doing other things, but um, you can find the poop plunger in Bed Bath and Beyond and, and a bunch of other retailers. So it, it took on a life of its own. And now, you know, I think everybody should have a plunger shaped like the poop. <laughs> I love the Squatty Potty. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a match made in heaven. Those <laughs> two, right? That's perfect. Yeah. So talk about then software and construction. So a yeah. company comes to you and, and walk me through it a little bit. Sure. So we have a, a lot of um, SaaS, software as a service clients, um, a lot of apps that we represent, a lot of um, uh, you know, software products. And a lot of those just recently are in the construction industry. You know, construction has really had a lot of pivoting that's had to happen during COVID. And we're representing a couple of products right now. One is a software that um, created, was created during COVID to monitor who came on and off a job site. Because, you know, there's not a front desk at a construction site, but they still had to be wary of who was on the site and whether they'd been tested or whatever to prevent COVID. And so this was a software that helped track through GPS and sign-ins who was on the site and who wasn't. And now they've really pivoted as the pandemic hopefully winds down, it's behind us, um, into tracking, uh, you know, all the paperwork that has to be done in construction projects and um, turning that into more of a, a software project rather than a paper project. Um, and this has been great. Our job is to market it to general contractors, essentially to construction firms who could streamline their businesses uh, through this product. And it's helped them grow and really cut costs during the pandemic, which has been important. So, you know, not all of our clients are huge household name brands. And I actually like that, Jeremy, because I like working with, with small, important companies who are doing really powerful things to help other businesses and help other consumers, you know, have their lives be better, grow their businesses. I, I think there's a real ripple effect to that. And that's the work that's sometimes the most satisfying. So Katie, when a company like that comes to you, are they, what services are they wanting off the bat? They're saying we need a new website or are they saying we just need leads. What do they actually come to you wanting? And obviously, you probably take more of a holistic approach, but I'm curious when they first come to you, what are they saying? I think this is actually surprising. And the best part of our business is they often don't know what they're looking for. You know, they come to us and say, we need more people to buy our software or we need more people to sign up for our program or purchase our product, whatever that is. Um, but they, they don't have it narrowed down to, we need SEO or Facebook or Google ads. Um, it's up to us to determine that. And I, I think that's my favorite part of our jobs is really digging into not only what's the company trying to accomplish, but what is the target audience looking for? What are the pain points? How are they interacting with content online? And how can we create a strategy that gets the right content, the right messaging in front of them and really drives action, which is all lead generation is, right? It's, it's driving action. And a, a lot of people will talk about lead generation in terms of funnels. And you can have the most sophisticated funnel in the world with 15 different moving parts. But Jeremy, if you don't have the content that gets somebody into the funnel because it's engaging, it, it's all for nothing. And so we're really looking first at the messaging and the, the stuff we've got to create to interact with to then get them into that lead generation funnel. Yeah. So from the software and construction to health fitness, like an infrared company. Tell me a little about that and if there's any differences in that process. Yeah, a lot of differences, right? Same tools, different strategy. 
So one of our clients is the first infrared uh, sauna studio in Las Vegas. They're bringing infrared therapy or, or red light therapy to Vegas. Um, and that works a lot like we work in fitness a lot. We launch a lot of gyms and fitness studios. And that's a similar strategy where you're trying to, to essentially pre-sell memberships before this thing opens, right? In the case of a gym, most people understand what the gym does. They might be looking for a fitness solution. But in the case of this infrared sauna studio, it's more of an education play because something like that hasn't existed in Vegas before now. We are really educating people on the benefits of red light therapy and what it can do for your body, your health, your mental well-being. And then once they're sold on those benefits, now we have to sell them into, okay, here's how you get those benefits and you need to pay this monthly subscription fee, you know, sign up for a package. But really it's generating that buzz and that interest and that action again before the sauna opens, the studio opens, so that when he launches, he has, you know, hopefully hundreds of memberships. You know, we, um, we launch a lot of F45 studios. That's a, a fitness franchise that's really taking off. They've done a great job and, and I work out there. I love F45. Um, but, but our goal is always to have 200, 250 pre-signups before they open. And so, you know, that takes a lot of work and a lot of, um, of the right tools in the right order. And it's about a three month process to make that happen. So companies have to start thinking about it well in advance, you know, while they're still building out the studio. You know, that's a lot different than having a software product that already exists that, you know, has the demo ready to go. And you're just driving to a landing page where they're going to sign up for a free demo. Um, it's the same mechanism, you know, content that drives action. But then in the case of software, it's a lot more about keeping in touch and really pushing them through that process because there are more steps that get from the free demo to buying the, the software product, which is typically a lot more expensive than you know, a membership at a gym, which is a low monthly cost. This could be hundreds or thousands of dollars of implementation of software. So it's a longer sales cycle. It's a lot more continuous education, continuous touching and staying top of mind once they've interacted with that landing page rather than a, a quicker sale. And now they're in the funnel. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. No, I love that. Um, and I love how you talked about, you know, the target audience and the pain points and focusing on that because that applies to any industry and really speaking to them, whether it's, I guess, a poop plunger or if it's infrared sauna studio, um, people probably have different pain points and, you know, there's a different target audience, I imagine. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes, you know, especially in the case of the infrared sauna, sometimes the audience doesn't know their pain points, right? No one's out there looking for infrared because it's going to solve their weight loss problems or their mental, you know, stress relief problems. Um, we have to tell them that this is the answer. And by the way, are you feeling stressed? Here's a new thing you could try rather than somebody who's experiencing pain and actively reaching out. Yeah. Are you feeling stressed during COVID? Well, <laughs> we, that's just about everyone. Um, yes. It's a good market right now. Uh, so talk about, I love to hear software and tools that you like either internally, externally, you're busy, you have yeah. lots of staff, you have multiple offices, how you stay productive. And so whether you use them, they're on your phone or your, your team uses them. I know some of my favorites, I use LastPass and Text Expander and SaneBox for my Gmail. So I'm curious, what are the software and tools you, you love or your team loves? Um, well, we, we live and die by project management and our project management software is called Teamwork. That's also our CRM. We use Teamwork CRM as well. And I really like those tools. They're user, um, user friendly. They're easy to you know, kind of intuitive, easy to use and um, do everything we need to run an agency as we grow. Um, my favorite, you know, tool on my Google email is the snooze button. If I can't deal with something right now or the deadline's a little farther out, I'll snooze it because I get about 300 emails a day. I don't know about you, but it, it's stressful. Just about the oh, same. Yeah. Right. It's, I panic when I'm like, oh my God, there's a hundred I haven't read yet. So if I can just snooze them and clear out the ones I don't have to deal with right away, it's good for my sanity. I so need to I'm use the that. snooze button more often. Yeah, I think <laughs> you should. This is something I deal with next week. So you just snooze <laughs> it to Monday, right? Nice. Um, so those are good. Um, I'm a big fan of calendar blocking. So I don't use to-do lists. Um, I literally, when I have something to do, I find a spot in my calendar when I'm going to do it and I make a slot for it. 
And that allows me to let go of the, the ruminating and the stressing about all the things I have to do, because I know there's a slot for it. And when it comes up on my calendar, I'll do it then. So that's been a lifesaver. And I actually teach that to my team. Mm. Uh, we have a policy at KWSM that uh, we don't send each other emails after hours. So between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m., we are not allowed to send emails to each other. And if you're going to write an email after five, you just schedule it for um, after seven the next morning. So scheduling is also my friend. Um, but I think that allows my staff not to ruminate about work when they're trying to enjoy their lives, right? It gives them more balance because when when you know there's emails piling up, you have the tendency to check it after hours, right? You're constantly checking to make sure you're not missing anything. And so we just have a policy that there's no need to check it because there's nothing that's going to be in there. And if something with a client blows up or there's a problem, which of course does happen sometimes, we text each other. And so, you know, if anything urgent happens, you're going to get a text and there's no need to be slave to your email after hours. So I think it's just putting systems like that into place that have been really a lifesaver for maintaining balance because agency life is hard. It can be 24 seven. It's, it's strenuous, you know, we go really hard during the day. And so we really look for things like that that can protect us at night or, or in off time. Katie, any other interesting policies? I love that one. That's a really cool one. Yeah. Um, I actually think one of the best things we implemented is the 980 work schedule. Do you know what that is? No. Okay. So 80 hours of work in two weeks, normal. But instead of working nine to five every day, we work nine hours Monday through Friday instead of eight. And then every other Friday, we're completely off. So we're still doing our 80 hours in two weeks. We're just allocating it a little bit differently. And uh, we implemented that about two years ago. And it's been a game changer for my staff because mm. it's 26 additional paid days off a year. And they can go on weekend trips. You know, they can really recharge because they can leave after work on Thursday and not come back till Sunday night and really get that benefit of the long weekend. So I think that's a good one. And then one of my favorites is actually, we have four offices, um, Orange County, San Diego and California, and then Atlanta, Las Vegas, and first quarter of next year, we're opening our Boston office. And so with these five locations, we have a policy that you can work in any KWSM office and not take vacation time. So as you might imagine, our Vegas office is very busy on Thursdays and Mondays because people can actually get off work at 4.30. We work 7 to 4.30 during the week. They get off work at 4.30 on Wednesday, get on a flight to Vegas, you know, wake up and go to the office Thursday morning there, but then at 4.30 Thursday, they're on vacation. They don't have to then take up vacation time by flying after work then. So um, likewise, they can be on vacation straight up until Sunday night at midnight, go to the office Monday morning, and then fly after work on Monday. And it, it just extends that time off. And it builds a lot of camaraderie between my team. You know, they get to meet their colleagues in other locations. And um, really, it builds the culture there, too. So it's a win-win. Or just spend the month in Vegas, for that matter. <laughs> yeah. Or you San could, Diego. Yeah. Yes, um, that's what I would do. Well, come on. Forget Chicago, like San Diego, so much nicer. Yeah. How did you discover and why uh, the 980? Or, or how'd you come up with that? You know, um, I, I guess this is another policy. After, every six months, I step away from my company for strategic planning time. And I'm gone three to four weeks where I don't have anything to do with the day to day operations of the business. Um, and this serves a couple of things. It, it gives me white space to really think about how I'm growing, you know, the strategic direction, what initiatives we need to take in place. But I also do a lot of research and a lot of learning about how to be a better leader and, and how to do things better for my staff. And the 980 is one of the things I discovered just in, in learning and research during one of these vision periods, I guess about two and a half years ago now. And I brought it back to my staff and I, I said, hey, this is something I learned about. Is this something we might be interested in? Because agency life is stressful and I wanted to give them that break. And to be honest, Jeremy, about half the staff said, yes, do it. And half the staff said, whoa, I'm not sure. That seems a little scary. You know, change is hard, even when it's good. And so we went through a three-month discovery process of learning about the 980. We had town halls where we got to ask questions, discuss it as a team. And then we ended up taking a team vote. And I said, if more than 50% of the staff votes for this change, we will enact it for one year to determine whether it's right for us. And they did. We got about 60% of the vote in favor. We enacted it. And the year was actually up mid-2020. 
by that time, everybody loves it, even though we can't go anywhere during 2020. And so it's, it's stayed ever since. Um, so it's yeah, stuck. that's sort of how it happened. That's very cool. I'd love yeah. to hear, you know, before the call, we are talking about the, the biggest things top of mind, hiring systems and management. And um, I want to start with the systems for a second. And so um, talk about some of the systems. Your husband came in, obviously, you know, Starbucks has to have tons of tons of systems and operations. So I'm wondering what things that you, that the company learned from him lessons and some of the things that were implemented systems wise, either by you or him. Yeah. Well, he brought a lot of great things to the company. Um, one of the things Starbucks does really, really well is train their employees, right? They have a very specific training program where everybody has to learn to make the, the drinks and run the store the exact same way, right? Because that Starbucks experience has to be consistent. And so um, he has a very specific process of, of training people where, you know, you teach them how to do it, you tell them how to do it, then you show them how to do it, then you have them do it and you watch and give feedback, then you have them do it without you there and you give feedback on their work, and then they can do it on their own. So it's this repetitive, you know, iterative process where there's a lot of feedback, a lot of um, asking for uh, make this small tweak or, or do it a little bit differently. So he brought that. Um, he also has some great interviewing uh, tactics. They do behavioral interviewing at Starbucks and we've really incorporated a lot of behavioral interviewing. You know, tell me what you would do in this situation. Tell me about a time that you, you know, those types of questions. So he's taught me a lot about that. Um, and really, you know, I'm interested in systems and processes because A, it makes things easier for the staff. They know what to do. They're able to innovate within those guidelines, which I think is easier than just saying, do whatever you want. That's stressful for people. And we have a creative agency. There is a lot of do whatever you want, but if we put guidelines and rules in place, it, it actually improves creativity, improves innovation because you know if you're going too far, right? It allows a little more freedom in that space. And so we start our engagements with a six week strategy process. And that process goes the same every time. We have the same series of meetings. We have the same sequence of the things we analyze and the work we do, the same deliverables to the client. And within that, there's a lot of flexibility, but that process allows us to ensure that there's a consistent onboarding experience for all of our clients. And, you know, I have, we, we deal with about 200 clients a year. So it, it's busy, a lot of moving parts. And that allows no matter who the account manager is, no matter who the lead on that strategy is, it allows us to deliver the same product and the same experience every time, which I think is important, you know, not just with Starbucks that you're getting your coffee, but really in any customer service or any service business. And, and we are a customer service business. We just happen to do digital marketing, but the client relationships, that client experience are, are number one. So I, I really believe in that, you know, we have a lot of systems in place that, you know, preserve work-life balance. I've talked about a few of them. We have a lot that, um, that, encourage ongoing development and um, personal and professional. You know, we use a management philosophy called best self-management. And in best self-management, it was created by David Hassel, who's the CEO of 15.5. I should mention that as a software tool. 15.5 is an engagement software. It's terrific. Um, but David really espouses a, a management philosophy and style where you get to know your employees on a personal basis, as well as um, a work basis, a skill set basis, and you understand that work and life are not separate. And David believes, and I, I agree, that work life balance is kind of a misnomer. It should be work life integration, right? Work is part of life, it's the biggest part of life in many cases. And we have to understand that the things that happen to our teammates outside of work affect their ability to work. And so all of the managers at KWSM are trained and certified in best self-management, which mm. means we get to know who our employees are as people and what they want out of their lives and careers, not just out of this job. And there are systems where we check in weekly. We have weekly one-to-ones. They fill out an asynchronous check-in form every week to let us know how they're feeling, scale of one to five, and if they have any concerns or challenges. We do reviews every 90 days. And we have um, a best self kickoff when somebody starts, which is a two hour meeting with really formulated questions to get to know somebody. So there's a process and a system that we follow there. And it really helps with not only onboarding of new employees, but really their experience throughout their tenure at the agency. 
Um, so things like that, I think are really important. It's, it's all about streamlining and and improving the experience for the the shareholders, clients, employees, all the people we touch. I love that. I'm going to check it out. It's 15 and then F I V E dot com. Yes. And um, what is um, meeting cadences look like? Um, Cause I know there's again, offices all over the country. Are they meeting more for just their internal office or is it more hands, you know, all hands meeting? I love to hear that. Yeah. So even though we have individual teams in all of our offices, we consider ourselves one agency, right? All of us work for the same company. We have the same goals. We serve the same clients. So it's a lot of all hands. Uh, we do an all hands huddle every morning from 710 to 725, 15 minutes uh, over Zoom. It's always been over Zoom, even pre-pandemic. We're in different cities. Uh, so that's a quick huddle. We, we talk about um, where do you need to collaborate? What deliverables are you waiting for from team members? You know, where are you stuck and might need help? And we just sort of touch base with each other to jumpstart our day. Uh, then we have a weekly all team meeting for an hour every Tuesday. We just had it this morning. Uh, and that's a time when I can communicate about any policies, any um, you know, deliverables we need to produce, any changes to to the way we're going to work or the clients, that sort of thing. And then everyone else has a chance to, to communicate things that the whole team needs to know as well. We also spend time going over one of our core values during that meeting every week. So we have seven core values and we pick one every week and discuss it as a team, which helps keep, keep us in touch with those things that we're, we're trying to espouse as we do our work. Um, and then there's a lot of meetings that happen throughout the week for onboarding new clients that not the whole team joins, but any member of that client's team, anyone who's going to work on that client. So we onboard one new client every week. It happens at 12 p.m. on Tuesdays. We have a getting started meeting every Tuesday at 12 p.m. That team will join. And then our strategy process takes about six weeks. So six weeks later, we have a strategy review meeting uh, that happens at 10 a.m. on Wednesdays. And so every Tuesday and every Wednesday, we're doing at least one getting started and at least one strategy review meeting. So those cadences are also built in to make sure we stay on track with client deliverables. I'm wondering, thanks for sharing that. Okay, that's really helpful. And I was talking to someone earlier today and he used to work at Google and he said there was a all hands meeting every week. And I think he said like, whatever, 50,000 people. And oh, wow. it was, you know, um, some of them are live, some of them are virtual, but it was like, listen, if they could do it, then everyone can do it, right? Um, sure. From an uh, operations perspective, um, SOPs wise, um, how do you keep track of your SOPs? Do you use software? I'm curious of how you keep track of, because you probably have clients in various industries, you do a lot of different services. How do you keep track of it all? Uh, well, this is not as sophisticated as maybe you were hoping, but I'll tell you the truth. We have a wiki. Uh, so we have a wiki for our training uh, protocols. We have a really robust um, three-month, 90-day training program for any new employee that comes on to KWSM. And we will train them in all our standard operating procedures as far as the way we interface with clients, the way we do the work on each of the channels, right? So there's a chapter in the wiki for Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and one for email marketing and one for ads. Um, so all of those are trained. And then we also train a lot of these work protocols that I've been telling you. No emails after 5 p.m. until 7 a.m. You know, working in any office, 9 to 5 work or a 980 workday, all of those things. So we keep a wiki and that allows us to uh, have access to it anytime. It's available on the Internet and also change it in real time. Because, as you know, the tools we use, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, are changing all the time. I like to say we work in the only industry where the tools we use are actively working against us. Uh, they don't like us to succeed. You know, Facebook doesn't want your ads to succeed and Google doesn't want you to show up in search. So what works last week isn't going to work next week, which means we have to have that kind of dynamic um, resource available that we can be constantly updated as these things change. And, and our SOPs change, quite frankly. I mean, we're, we're doing that in real time because what works changes. Yeah. Um, Kitty, I have one last question and I just want to thank you. I, you know, could listen to you talk about this all day because it's really fascinating how you manage it all and how you started it. Um, 
And before I ask it, I want to point people towards kwsmdigital.com. They could learn more. There's an about us, the services, the clients page, learn more on their blog. So check out kwsmdigital.com to learn more uh, there. And are there any other places online we should point people towards? Now, our website is pretty comprehensive. I like it there. You can follow us on social media. We, we drink our own Kool-Aid, do all those channels, but, um, but the website's great. Cool. There's actually, sorry, Jeremy, there's actually a, a checklist if you want to know how your digital infrastructure is doing um, as far as, um, you know, can you generate leads? Are there things that need to be in place or changed? We have a really robust checklist available on our website that you could download for free and, um, and do a little assessment on your own digital. That's great. I love it. Yeah. So if you're on the homepage, where's the best place to navigate to the checklist? I don't know if you... Probably um, go to one of our services pages and it'll okay. ask you if you want to sign up for an audit and you just fill that out and you'll have access to it. Got it. Awesome. So you can go to kwsmdigital.com and then there's a services tab and click on one of those to, to learn more. Um, yes, I could see that request 30 minute audit. Yeah. Um, the last question, okay, what's interesting is you're also a certified first responder and yeah. Yeah. Um, you were actually one of the first rescuers allowed into New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And so I'm wondering yeah. if you could talk about that a little bit in your experience there. Yeah, I would love to. That was one of the most life-changing things I've ever done. So I'm a first responder with American Humane Association. So animals, not people. Don't ask me to you know, <laughs> save you in a heart attack, but if your dog is having a problem, I could probably handle it. Uh, so yes, I, um, I am certified in, in search and rescue for American Humane, and I was deployed to Hurricane Katrina um, in the first weeks of the disaster, and I was there when the levee broke. And our job, I, I spent about six weeks there living in a parking lot in New Orleans in an RV. Um, and our job was to go door to door. You remember when the levee broke, many people were at work and they didn't know that they weren't going to be allowed home. So they didn't take care of their pets. You know, pets were locked at home and there was no way for citizens to get back to rescue those animals. So our job as rescuers was to go door to door and check on the animals that may have been left behind. You know, were they safe or did we need to take them to a temporary shelter? Um, you know, did they need medical attention? Did they need food and water? So, so we did that and we actually had the National Guard that was assigned to work with us and they would protect us as we went house to house because you remember there was a lot of, of looting and a lot of violence in New Orleans during that time. And it was, it was scary in some ways just to be out there, you know, essentially breaking into houses, but for the good of rescuing the animals, right? Um, and so the National Guard went with us and we'd go and we'd gain access to these houses, check on the pets, if they needed to. How do you gain access? Like when you walk up to the, I mean, you breaking a window? Like, what do you do? I mean, yes, or, or a door yeah. or, you know, yeah. if that's a euphemism. Your right? Kung Fu skills. I mean, what? what? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can tell that I'm, I'm a large person. I have lots of brute strength. Yes. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. I mean, we'd, we'd break windows. We'd knock down doors. We'd do what it took to get in there. And mm. remember, a, a lot of these buildings had already had floodwaters come through. So these were not pristine homes. These were homes that had been you know, had sludge dragged through them and, and many times windows broken just from flooding and that sort of thing. Um, and, and animals in, inside were in rough shape and needed us. So um, in many cases, we'd take the animals, administer medical attention, and then take them to a temporary shelter to be reunited after the, the emergency was over with their owners. Um, but also, you know, Jeremy, a lot, of, a lot of animals that had passed, a lot of um, animals that didn't make it through that we, we found. And I think that was an important part of our jobs too, because we were able to let owners know what had happened, right? And provide some kind of closure because remember these were people that had been displaced and, and were not sure what of their lives was left. And it, it was really powerful and really haunting to be in these people's homes because they just left for work that morning, you know, just like normal. And think about when you and I do that and we'd walk in and you know, the half drunk coffee cup was on the counter or their planner was open, you know, with a big red X for plans later that night or their clothes were laid out on the bed for the gym that evening. Um, it was really a, a powerful look into the everyday lives of, of these people that had just sort of been frozen in time. And then, you know, during the six weeks I was there, we pulled 10,000 animals out of New Orleans 
right. and fed and sheltered them and took care of them. And if they couldn't be uh, reunited with their owner because we couldn't find the owner or, or something like that, um, we sent them to shelters all over the country where they were rehomed and went on to new happy endings. So um, it was tremendously powerful. Uh, I, I loved my time there as much as you can love being part of something that was so so horrific for so many people, but it, it felt like making a difference and that was life-changing. That's wild. Katie, yeah. what, what, yeah. what sticks out um, if you were describing, mean, it's probably hard to describe the scene, but does any, anything stick out that you can describe one particular scene of either a house or when you got there just to kind of paint a picture a little bit? So for someone who's not there to kind of visualize the, the yeah. craziness. Yeah, I'll tell you a story. So you remember that when the when the flooding happened, when the levee broke, the water was toxic, right? So um, we were not allowed to touch the water. And so you're you're driving around in boats. And when you're driving through the streets in like inflatable boats, you're hitting street signs, like tall street signs that are the level now of where the water is. So they're like little speed bumps in the water. That's how high the, the flooding was. But you couldn't touch the water. We we actually had somebody. Um, that I knew fall out of the boat and pass away because the, the water is not safe. Um, and what was so toxic about it? The, the... I, you know, it's not a pretty answer, but this water had washed through cemeteries. It had washed. There's a lot of oh. excrement in these things through the water. It just wasn't clean. Right. right. Um, and, and then also, you know, there was a lot of people because there was violence that were dead from those things. And this was the first time I saw dead bodies like not in a controlled situation, right? A hospital or, or things like that. Remember I was a journalist, so I, I had seen those situations before, but this was very raw, very um, gruesome in a way. But I'll tell you about a, a specific house we went into where, where we went inside and there were two cats that we knew were in the house because the owners had communicated with American Humane and left a list of animals we were supposed to find. And I, I don't know if you know anything about cats, but they're not just coming when we call, right? These cats are hungry, they're traumatized. They're hiding. And our job is to turn things over and find them and, and catch them, essentially. And so things in the house have been misplaced because blood water has washed through. There's kind of this like black sludgy, you know, goo all over everything. You know, couches are covered in it. Tables are knocked over. Things have been knocked off counter. So it looks like a disaster area. And we are picking through this, trying to find cats and then catch cats. And um, I will show you, you're on my Zoom, but see this, see this scar right here? Mm -hmm, yeah. Okay, well, there's a matching one on this side of my wrist, right? I don't know if you can see it right here. And that is because I found one of these cats, grabbed it, and it bit me here, right? And remember, I'm in a situation with toxic water and sludge, and it's probably not clean. And now I have a cat bite that broke skin, made a huge scar on my wrist. And all I could think about was, I can't let go of this cat. Like, darn, that hurts, but I can't let go of this cat because if I do, the cat's going to get lost again and may not make it out of this. And so I get the cat to the, the carrier and we get him and we find the other cat and we get out of there. And I'm, I'm wearing plastic gloves, but there's blood running down my oh. arm throughout these plastic gloves. And I go to the campsite and I know that if my commander in chief there finds out that I've been injured this way, I will not be allowed to stay. And that was not okay with me at the time. I felt like I was making a difference. I did not want to go home. And so I actually never told this story publicly and I probably shouldn't, but it was a long time ago now. I was young and foolish back then. I, um, I wrapped up the cuts, nobody could see it. And I went to the onsite vet and I said, hey, today we, um, we rescued this Great Dane, about 110 pounds and it looks like they have a cut. And do you have any antibiotics? And they gave me antibiotics for 110 pound Great Dane which I then took to prevent an infection in my wrist. And uh, it was Cipro, I took Cipro. And I live to tell the tale, my wrist is fine. I just have two little scars, which reminds me of that time in my life, which is great. The cat was fine and uh, it all ended okay. But um, that's a snapshot of what life was like there. And, and you know how strongly I felt about the work we were doing and, and I wasn't leaving. Katie, I'm gonna be the first one to thank you. I thought you were gonna ask him to stitch it up. Um, also, but without any anesthetic. Um, so I'm glad you just asked for antibiotic. Everyone go check out kwsmdigital.com. And Katie, thank you. It's an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. What I got, you can't buy. 
Here is signs between my eyes Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side